this notion of solidarity across social movements is what animates um, the imaginary about talking um, across uh, the Romani uh, movement as well as the Black Lives Matter or the movement for black lives within the historical radical um, le uh, liberation struggle for peoples of African descent within the United States and around the world, and uh, the Palestinian liberation struggles among others. Um, so we will move into this conversation by posing two primary questions um, because the context of liberation stems from um, linkages across our social movements. As we've heard, Romani women have been subjected to uh, historical legacies of, of, uh, of white supremacy and interlocking mechanisms that foster marginalization, oppression, and dehumanization. Um, it is no secret that such is the case for the, the, the anti-black legacies of enslavement, of, colo of, of, of colonialism and imperialism around the globe when it comes to persons of African descent. So our movements are firmly rooted within the context of these historical and contemporary uh, systems of oppression. But I think our solidarity also finds its place firmly rooted in our local struggles. Um, as a part of the movement for black lives, um, the uh, mechanisms, the, the, the police murder that sparked the most current iteration of the black liberation struggle within the United States um, is also tied and linked to policing systems and mechanisms that are, are historical, right? We've, we've, we've heard about Romani uh, uh, people's um, uh, uh, struggles within policing systems and systems of displacement and surveillance. Um, we also know that the same mechanisms that operate within the prison industrial complex within the United States, surveillance systems, um, are also the same systems that are, that are used in Palestine. Um, and there has been a long relationship of linkage within the Dalit liberation struggle. It was in the 1940s that W, that uh, Dr. B.R. Bedker wrote a letter to W.E.B. Du Bois um, regarding the um, Negro uh, uh, movement that was afoot um, by the, the, uh, the, the Negro African Congress that was taking a case to the United Nations around um, human rights um, for, for, the, for black people within the Americas. Secondly, the, another uh, place that I want to highlight this idea and notion of decolonizing feminism is that this iteration of the movement for black lives differs significantly in the uh, legibility of who it is that is at the fore of the movement. While it is, it is a continuum, while it stands on the shoulders of previous liberation struggles and lineages, within the movement, both within the United States and outside of the United States. The movement for black lives, particularly Black Lives Matter, um, was galvanized um, in 2014 when Mike Brown was, was shot, was murdered by the police in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, and on the, 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 the precedent to that had been that Patrice Cullors, uh, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi, three black women who I, whom I identify as queer women, um, had become fed up, sick and tired of being sick and tired of black murders and then the exoneration of the police who, have, who murder black, black people. Um, and that was during the Trayvon Martin um, uh, uh, case. And so when Mike Brown happened, this, our movements 
uh, galvanized within um, the uprisings in Ferguson, and uh, there have been several um, other momentous uh, murders of black, black people within the United States, but the um, galvanization of the movement for Black, Lives in, uh, for Black Lives Matter in particular was founded by everyday working people, local organizers in Ferguson who had already been advocating and organizing within their local communities, um, as well as uh, poor and working class people, um, and a movement that uh, is, is led by women, by uh, LGBTQ persons, non-gender conforming persons, which markedly looks different um, in, in this particular moment. And furthermore, I think one of the um, most significant things about the imaginary for Black Lives Matter is that it is a reconfiguration of what does it mean to be human? So whose lives matter within the context of the vicious legacies of white supremacy, right? And so in order to answer that question, we must affirm and continue to affirm our full dignity, sacred worth, and humanity within the context of the black liberation struggle, but also recognize that wherever it is happening locally and around the globe. And so such linkages to the Palestinian liberation struggle, as well as the Dalit liberation struggle and the Romani liberation struggle is what it, that is the thing that has brought us here to this moment. And so within that context, there's so much more to be said about that. Um, but I want to get to our panelists, and also I want to cede some a few moments to a co-sponsor of the of our time together, and that is um, our colleague from the Black Student Union here at Harvard University. So welcome. So I'll be very brief, but my name is Salim Aitoka. I am a Master in Public Policy candidate at the Harvard Kennedy School, a member of the Black Student Union. Uh, the reason that we're here today, as someone who is black, Congolese, who learned about race, who learned about gender within the African continent, and then learned about it here, um, there's so much that I am learning from all of you but also learning about these issues and how we're interconnected and how people want to keep they want to keep you oppressed. They don't want you to speak, to speak up and to see that you're connected to all these other issues and to all these other movements. So for me and from Black Student Union, we are thrilled that we can co-sponsor this and we're just happy to be having these conversations. And again, I'm grateful to you all and I'm learning from you all. So thank you. Thank you, Salima, and congratulations on a powerful black policy conference that just took place at the Kennedy School this weekend. So without further, further ado, I'd love to um, have, have us to hear from someone who needs very little introduction because uh, she has been the inspiration, the shoulders upon which many of us stand, and her visionary and imaginative work continues um, to give space and, <laughs> and um, uh, uh, freedom, if you will, liberation, epistemological liberation to many of us. And it is uh, none but the wonderful Professor Patricia Hill Collins, whom we will hear from um, next. No. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Originally, I thought I would talk for two minutes, and then they uh, shocked me at lunch and said, take, a, take 20, and I thought, well, I'm a little nervous now. <laughs> All right, but... Um, I'd like to just talk about this whole process of basically flipping the script. Right now we have a script in a lot of Western knowledge, this is an epistemological approach, so you should really appreciate this, that basically puts certain groups at the center and positions the rest of us as the others. And I would suggest that we flip that script. So rather than trying to figure out how to get uh, Romani women and black women and Dalit women and Palestinian women into a preformed feminism, thereby suggesting that what it needs is to be reformed. I think we might need to build it from the bottom up because that's a losing strategy for me. There's no place for me there. 
So what I decided to do today in this panel is really talk to you a little bit about my path to feminism and how I view the emergence of black feminism as in many ways an indigenous black feminism that is not derivative of white women. Maybe that is the case that we need to make and maybe that is the case that all of us need to make such that when I'm further along down the road of black feminism, I find you. Romani woman, I find you, Dalit women, I find groups who are engaged in similar struggles to look at their own particular historic situations and to ask, what have those struggles looked like in relationship to social injustice and oppression? So it's historically grounded, but it's a way of working with ideas to name one's own experiences to free oneself. So I'm going to talk about black people in the United States, but I am not necessarily presenting this as the universal story from which everyone must take inspiration. This is a particular story that might contain universal themes that become the basis of solidarity. So I'm interested in building the argument of solidarity from the ground up where we are now. This is not going through the center uh, and that makes people uncomfortable sometimes. If you're in the center, you don't like the fact that people don't want to talk to you anymore. They want to talk to each other and not through or about you even, unless you're secondary to that particular discussion. Do you see where I'm coming from here? Mm -hmm. All right, that is prefacing the remarks that I brought today. So let me tell you about my path to feminism. For me, black feminism is not a variety of feminism, like a, a flavor of ice cream, something you find by beginning in feminism and then adding in or adding in the experiences of black women. Rather, black feminism emerged in response to the existential challenges that faced people of African descent who were enslaved in this country. This is a labor issue. This is also an appropriation of property issue. This is a class and capitalism issue, even though we don't talk about it as much as we uh, would like, and who had to work out a new world identity in that context. There were no black people before this. There were Africans, there were different ethnic groups, but there was no such thing as the black person who is the body of the black person would be African American uh, enslaved, but also people who are socially black. The notion of you become the black people at the bottom of society. So black I'm using both specifically and I'm using it um, a bit more uh, broadly. The very creation of black people emerges from the syncretism of culture that people brought with them and the political subordination of being enslaved. And the, the challenge there is how does one develop a new world identity that is cobbled together from both those ideas and experiences. So I'm not talking about a nostalgia for a lost Africa. I'm not talking about an identity that is just one that's honed in material conditions. I'm looking at the ways that one looks at grappling with this particular reality, which is where our ideas begin, where experiences begin. How do we make sense of it? So the content of black feminist thought to me from the very beginning has been all about this exact issue of state-sponsored racialization and marginalization. Now, we were asked to respond to that particular question, and we tend to think about that question in terms of contemporary relations. But what I'm saying is that this is part of the long-standing historic challenge that has confronted black people. Ooh, I didn't know I was gonna say all that. I got all inspired there. All righty. <laughs> okay. What are those existential challenges? The dual challenges are survival and freedom. First, to survive experiences like that. And I want to point out that a lot of people today are grappling with this issue of survival, which is fundamentally a political question. How does one survive oppression? But also, if one does survive, what is the nature of moving toward freedom? What are the possibilities of living as a free person, as a free human? Now, this is, if I look at African American history and look at the slave experience, the expendability of black lives did not start two years ago when somebody discovered it. This is part of the existential challenge of survival and freedom for African Americans from day one. 
under slavery, under Jim Crow, under various systems of rule, each of which had tactics or technologies to um, ensure survival of people up to a certain point to be exploited, and denied freedom. The question to me that is the core question that might inform any kind of feminist sensibility is, what did black people do in response to those existential challenges? Did they wait for someone to save them? Did they wait for somebody to come with an agenda and say, you know, I'm going to tell you how oppressed you are, poor thing. Here's my analysis of, how, of white supremacy and how it's affecting you. Or did they develop independent analyses of our own situation that address those existential challenges, which are still with us, by the way, right? Up to today, survival, this is what Black Lives Matter to me is all about, you know, sort of lives matter, and then freedom. How is it that we do not have the rights yet to live fully free? So this is an old existential challenge that takes a contemporary form. So now, here's where the feminism comes in. Because to me, these existential challenges have had um, different effects on African Americans who are heterogeneous. When you're looking at the notion of survival and the issue of freedom, gender is quite significant. And if you're the woman in that situation or the man in that situation, you begin to see the gender specific ways that these mechanisms operate, that oppression operates. It's almost like a tailored, specialized oppression which means you need a specialized resistance to deal with that. So, something like violence. Well, what kind of violence are we talking about? Lynching? Or are we talking about reproductive control issues? Those are gender-specific, not exclusive, but gender-specific forms of control. Gender-specific forms of ensuring uh, or sort of dealing with the survival of black people, for whom, by the way, black women are quite significant in terms of having the children. And the f issue of freedom. Who carries the vision of freedom from one generation to the next? Mm. So to me, you have a black feminism that is very much involved in solving specific social problems as they present themselves during different historical eras, something like Ida Wells Barnett, who took on an anti-lynching campaign and is typically seen not as a feminist because she wasn't talking about women's emancipation issues. But in a lot of ways, she's presenting a very deep black feminist agenda around this issue of violence, this issue of survival, this issue of freedom, and how a feminist perspective or a black feminist perspective speaks to that. So for me, this whole notion of um, an indigenous, I call it an indigenous black feminism that remained unnamed as feminism. It did not need the term feminism to be real. So it was not all about are you really a feminist or are you not a feminist? Those questions to me in many ways are red herrings that take us away from the hard work of crafting what a resistance movement would look like that truly empowers people who are on the bottom. And surprise, surprise, even though the challenges are still there, we're still here. We survived. We're freer, quote, than we used to be. I'm not picking cotton somewhere. I have a desk, I have electricity, I have a degree. I know how to work my phone. Some days I'm not as sure about that, all right? I can drive, I can do a lot of things, but that doesn't mean I think I'm free, because I'm not because it's part of an ongoing struggle to survive and be free. I know at any point in time, someone can kill me because black lives are, for many people, expendable. And then I become a news story. She was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or what was that kid doing out there? So we all know that this is the vulnerability of living a precarious black life. You know, in that space of um, trying to survive and trying to be free. And I think a lot of black feminism, it's not an external import. This is another red herring. Oh, you're a feminist. That means you're associated with white people. I mean, this is like silly. Seriously, knock it off, all right? I mean, I'm talking about these ongoing existential challenges from one generation to the next and how one addresses those challenges from one generation to the next and how that is a gender specific process and how women are central to that survival and that vision of freedom. You'll find within black culture a lot of sort of reverence for mothers 
Well, mothers are often the ones who are very significant. It's not maternal politics. It's actually a form of feminism that remains unnamed as such. And it's different than the strong black woman, but it's also tied to oppression as well. All right, I'm getting all excited here. Let me calm down. All right, so in other words, oh gee, I just lost my, well, fine. I just lost my little thing in the phone after I told you I knew how to work it. All right. But basically what I would argue is what we find with black feminism is a long and storied history over quite some time of grappling with these issues. And in each era, there being different responses, and that's been really significant in moving uh, people forward. Only recently has black feminism gotten a visibility in public space thereby thinking it was created, people thinking it was created by Alice Walker or the people who brought, who brought voice to it in, in public space. But I'm talking about something that's quite old because it's part of the whole struggle of life and we now bring it forward to today. So, and what do we find today? We find, ah, the world has changed. We have new tools to talk to one another. So what appeared to be an independent, particular struggle is particular, but it's interconnected with those struggles of people and women who are in very different cultures historically, very different political systems, perhaps economic systems, but who occupy a similar position in those places and who have been dealing with similar existential issues. And we find that there are parallels in the issues themselves violence, body politics, all of that. We find that there is in fact a feminist quote agenda that doesn't come when someone puts it into the begging bowl of, of the people at the bottom from above. So I see no need to even worry about mainstream feminism. That is one particular feminism among many. To me, this is the place where you begin to have dialogues between yourself and all the work that you've done to generate that independent, resistant tradition and find the people who are doing the same thing. And this is a wonderful moment for that. That's one reason I am thrilled to be on this panel with all my new friends, like Angel. <laughs> <laughs> because I know very little about what they know a lot about. And that is exactly the kind of conversation that I think each of these discourses needs to have. So we can cross-fertilize one another, so we can build something new and model a different form of solidarity that is not predicated upon one group subordinating itself to another group or worshiping another group as being ahead. It's not about that at all. It's about a rival in this place of now at the same historic moment with tools where we can talk to one another. So for me, this is very exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Collins. Um, so just a, a, a reminder to our, to our panelists um, that what we're exploring as our first question that each of our panelists will speak to is um, this notion um, that the interlocking mach machineries of oppression against black and women of color across, across the globe find many similarities, many of which we've, we've already heard about, such as forced sterilization, uh, to mass incarceration, police murder and criminalization of black persons and, and per indigenous and persons of color. What are some of the major uh, state-sponsored injustices used as tools of racialization and marginalization of the women that you are working with. We've just heard of a wonderful um, textured and nuanced framework and context from Professor Collins um, as well. Uh, so our speakers will speak specifically within that context as we move forward. So next we'll hear from Angela uh, Coetzee. Okay, so it's really hard to talk at uh, almost six o'clock. It's uh, midnight in Europe, so sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a bit jet lagged. 
but, um, but just bear with me. So I'm, I'm really happy, and I would like to follow on the same line, actually, that I'm really committed and I'm really happy to flip the narrative, to change the narrative. And I think this kind of occasion where we are sitting right now, that we would like to change the narrative. And when we are talking about decoloniality and why we chose this specific frame, decolonizing feminism, as, as I pointed out at the very beginning, that we would like to connect perspective, expressions, thought, struggles, processes, practices of decoloniality that are emerging in various corners of the world. And um, as it turned out that somehow it seems that the struggles and the systemic oppression, it's affecting a very particular racialized group of people, right? almost in a similar way, of course in a different social, historical, political context, but mm -hmm. still there are some similarities. If we think about it, why Roma are overrepresented amongst the unemployed, right? Why blacks are overrepresented in the prison system? Why blacks are overrepresented amongst the people who are, you know, in a suffering from a long-term unemployment, or why the Dalit uh, has no access to quality of education, why Palestinian women <laughs> and why Palestinian has a lack of access to quality education, healthcare, and access to power, access to, to resources. And here, just referring back to Aniko, that we are talking about uh, a structural racism, a structural violence, which somehow affecting the marginalized and racialized people in a kind of similar way. I just would like to go back to some statistics and quoting the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights based in Vienna, and they just published a report in 2013, and, and actually um, they collected the data and this shows that, for instance, 21% of Romani women are in paid work compared to 35% of Romani men. Just to reveal the precarious situation of Roma, in 2007, in the 28 EU member states, the average female paid employment rate was almost 67%. Right, 67, Romani women, 21. Why that of men was just over 78%. That was published by the European Commission in 2018. And Romani men was 35% of Romani men who had some um, um, paid job. So basically, that shows the vulnerability, the vulnerable status of Romani women, Romani men as well, compared to non-Roma. And um, so it's, a, it's clearly an indicator. I'm sure that if we would check some statistics in US as well, we would end up with uh, black Americans, Latinos are really <laughs> overrepresented amongst those who are uh, living under the poverty line. According to the analysis, 87% of Roma households have an income below the national um, at risk of poverty level compared to 46% of non-Roma households surveyed and compared to 17% uh, for the EU's population in general. So if I'm gonna see you know, the two um, sides, 87% of Roma households are under the poverty level compared to non-Roma, 17, right? So it's how many times higher? Six minimum, right? Six times higher. And, um, and also this report shows that families with four or more children are more likely to have the highest at risk of poverty rate, as many as 90%, 90% nine of Roma families with four or more children are below at risk of poverty threshold. So I just wanted to bring this statistics illustrate the structural violence, the structural oppression, 
uh, of racialized Roma in Europe, but we would bring, you know, uh, similar statistics from a different corner of the world that um, racialized people are again facing structural oppressions and structural racism. And um, why we are call it uh, decoloniality? Because basically, in the early 90s, by Latin American scholars, was, pay, uh, was coined the term of coloniality of power, the coloniality of power, which is actually manifested even in our global capitalism as well, right? In a similar way, it's about domination, it's about oppression, it's about lack of access to resources. And, and of course, the global politics as such is very much complex today than it was in the, in the period of Cold War, right, in the 70s and 80s. And um, we know the election of Donald Trump and, uh, and the announced shift from neoliberal globalism to national Americanism, or if we think about Europe, um, you know, the Orban, government in Hungary, which is again kind of national, nationalist, or even, even some people call it like as a, as a fascist capitalism, or, and um, so it's a very much further complicating the situation, even you know, in the, in, 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 at the global level, and of course at the local level as well, how is it manifested? And, um, and of course, how can, how can we come out from this, right? And what can we do as a marginalized and, and racialized people who are facing with an endemic, systemic, uh, oppressions which are very much imbricated in the system where, where it's a norm to be oppressed as a racialized people, where it's a norm to be excluded, uh, where it's a norm to be exploited because that's the way how it is, right? And, um, and what can we do? Is there another possible word? Is there a word? Is there something what we can imagine and um, which is structurally different from the one where we are living right now? And, and I just would like to remind you actually today we already discussed many times the Audrey Lord, right, who was talking about that for the master tools we will never dismantle the master house. And um, they may allow us temporarily um, to bid or use their own game, right? But, but they never really will enable us to, 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 to liberate. So what can we do? And today, it's uh, such a beautiful day because we started <laughs> in the class of Corner West, and 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 there was a lecture about the, the life of um, <coughs> Malcolm X, and who was talking about you know burning down the master's house, 1962, and right now we are 2019. So what can we do? Can we transcend? Uh, you know. Uh, can we, can we advance? Can we do something? Can we, can we build some other little houses, right? And uh, which will seize the, men, um, the, 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 the hegemony of the master houses if we will have a critical mass of little houses which can create some kind of alternative ways, right? Can, can it seize the master house? Can we offer a shelter and rooms for each other? And I think that's where solidarity can start. And I will stop here. Thank you.
There is so much to be said about the legacies we've been bequeathed um, within the context of, of dehumanization and oppression. And I will also say there's so much to be said about the legacies of resistance, of creativity and imagination that we too, like the notion of Sankofa, uh, admonishes us to do. Um, to remember, not to forget, never to forget these atrocities that has happened among our peoples, but to also retrieve that which has been given to us because we would not have survived. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, and I'm not answering your question, but I do want to uh, sort of trouble so that we can begin to, to and continue to think about um, the, the, the imaginaries and, and it's a miracle that some of us have survived, that our peoples have survived. And so what were the resources that within themselves, within their genius, within their imagination, that they took nothing and made something of that? Right? And so we want to talk about that. I think decoloniality has always been there. Right? As, Patricia, as, as Professor Collins says, feminism has always been there. My grandmother didn't have lang the language and the theories around feminism, but from, for all intents and purposes, she knew she was already a human, right? She knew that her humanity mattered and her lives and, and, and our lives matter. And so I want us to follow and keep track of these resources um, within the lineages as we talk about not only decolonization, but feminisms. Um, and what we have been given to thread and continue to weave, how we can continue to build um, um, our, our solidarities and linkages across movements. Next, we um, are privileged to hear from Ten Mori Sandarajan. Did I say that right? Yes. So um, uh, then we'll, we'll hear from Ten Moji, our Dalit um, uh, panelist at the moment. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, in the Dalit movement, we greet each other with the term Jabim, which is a, a, a language of justice and a salute of power. Um, but for me, I feel like so much of what my earlier panelists have said, and also I think why we're here in this room today, is that this is not an academic conversation. This is an urgent conversation that really guides the survival, not just of our individual movements, but of our species. And for me, I think the question we have to think about why we are here is are we here to study our extinction or are we here to get free? And for me, it's about fucking freedom. And I, and I think that decolonization is a key part of what we need to talk about to be free. Because again, if we keep putting ourselves into our masters and mistresses boxes, then how are we able to be able to find our way out um, with visionary options, not just reactionary strategies? And for me, I think that as someone who is Dalit, you know, I work on the issue of caste apartheid. And this is a system of oppression that is one of the oldest in the world. It's one in which I am told that I'm spiritually defiling to other people because of my caste. And that my caste determines the whole of my life under Brahminism. It determines where I live, it determines who I'll marry, and it determines my proximity to violence and structural violence. Every hour, three Dalits are murdered, two are raped, and three of our houses are burnt. So just think what's happened in the context of our conversation today. So for me, I have to speak with the urgency of my people because that violence has been here for centuries. And in fact, the way that I learned about the Roma people, and this is my nerdy self, is I was looking up untouchable, because Dalits were known as formerly untouchable. I looked it up in different languages, and when I found the untouchable word for Greek, it came up with Romani and Gypsy people. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> And you will never learn about the ancestral connection between the caste oppressed peoples of the subcontinent and those who are of our diaspora in our Romani kindred. And yet, when we talk about decolonizing our experience, it's not just about white supremacy, it's about Brahminism. And I think this is also what changes when we have feminism from the bottom. Because as a Dalit woman and as a Dalit feminist, I think that one of my greatest struggles and the people who were some of the biggest gatekeepers were not white women, but were upper caste feminists. Mm -hmm. 
And upper caste feminists, they know how to speak a lot about white people and colonialism and post-colonial constructs, but post-colonial constructs were never meant to be uh, simply used without an understanding of the internal hegemonies that they hide. So for every academic that you meet that is South Asian, find out if they're from an upper caste. Find out the position that they're taking and who are they hiding in taking that position. And why is it that we study caste and we study the consequences of caste privilege so that we know all about Dalits and we know about the violence, but we don't know what are the networks of privilege that benefit from it. We would never talk about anti-blackness without talking about white supremacy. Why are we not talking about Brahmanism? Because it hides itself. Brahmanism is actually the mother of white supremacy. Because where did Aryans come from? And yet, it hides itself so effectively because again, we are, not, we are so much focused on trying to integrate into the master's house instead of blowing it up. And my sense is, is that our power, our position comes from when we see ourselves through struggle, but also tell our stories of resistance. And I think that my feminist practice really comes from my ancestors. I come from a caste that's known as the Badian caste. Um, it's a caste that's from Tamil Nadu. It was established in the 13th century. And the name Badian gave word to the English word pariah. Because to our English colonial masters, how we were being treated was so bad, they made it a word for themselves to talk about the way someone would be outcasted. But I think about the fact that in the 13th century, my ancestors would have no experience of freedom in any way, shape, or form. And yet, hope was a micro-expression in their mind, that mothers took their children, and the legacy they could give of resistance was love. They would not have physical freedom, but there could be a mental expression of a hope of freedom, such that generations later, they would have a granddaughter that would be free. And that granddaughter is me, right? All of us who are here who are the survivors of generations of violence, we are our ancestors' best dreams. But how and what we do with that legacy is crucial to our understanding, not just of our people and our movements, but of the fate of the planet right now. Because we are facing one of the greatest crises of time where white supremacy doesn't even see other people in terms of mattering. It doesn't even see the world to matter. So how we think about building our movements is not optional. Solidarity is not a transaction where it's like, oh my gosh, I went to the Women's March and look at my Feminism as a Future shirt. It's really about co-liberation. <laughs> and that I don't have a choice to not learn about your movement because guess what? Our oppressors are conspiring already. I learned about this at the World Conference Against Racism where I saw the US government and Israel and India conspire with each other to make sure that Zionism and caste and reparations would not get into that document. And we as community movements were just learning from each other on the ground in the streets of Durban. So in so many ways, dialogues like this, and it's such a gift that the Romani feminists gave to us, are crucial because, you know, Dalit is a term that comes from this idea that we were broken by caste. But I think we've been all broken by systems of oppression. Parts of us flung to different parts of the world because that's what capital does. But when we tell each other stories, we bring back this larger vision of who we could be as a species. Mm -hmm. And we get to know parts of ourselves and collect back our hearts so that we can be one united visionary possibility. And I think that to me is also what I want to talk about with intersectionality, is that in many ways, um, we have to question intersectionality from a global perspective. We can no longer have it be defined by European and North American contexts. Because intersectionality um, and how we speak to our problems is really going to come from countries in the global south that see the new terrains of this violence and have the language to talk about what are the different kinds of oppressors. So for me, the fact that most of the people in this room don't know Brahmanism is a problem. Because not only is it one of the oldest systems of oppression, but one out of four people in the world are South Asian. One out of six are Indian. How do we not know that grouping of the world, which is so crucial to our global capitalist economy? 
right? Um, but I also think what's also really powerful about some of the things that our Romani sister shared is that every experience of violence that you shared, I have a similar and parallel story within Dalit women. And that's also, you know, like sterilization, 37% of Dalit women have um, faced some form of forced sterilization. What is the cost of <coughs> sterilization? People are paid $20 to be sterilized without anesthesia. $20, sterilized without anesthesia. And where's the funding coming from? UK development funds for population growth. So decolonizing in this context means also looking at where do we see new forms of colonial constructs in the form of development, in the form of improvement, in the form of study, that how do we see those relationships of power and knowledge and, and economy? And then I also think what's also really important about being able to know each other is to be able to heal with each other. Mm -hmm. There's no way that you don't do this work without having some form of secondary trauma. Most of us here are already survivors, but also to relearn the scope and the scale of the structural is also to engage with the violence. And how many of us wrote these papers with tears in our eyes? <clears throat> How many people sat and did interviews and talked with your brothers and your sisters and saw, here I am making knowledge at the point of genocide. What does that do for you as a person? What does that do for you as a people? And I think healing requires us to know that we have survived this kind of violence, but that also we will need each other to be able to survive this moment even still. And that some of us won't make it. Some of us have already not made it. In the Trump administration, how many people have been deported? How many people, I think about that one trans sister that was deported to El Salvador and was murdered upon her return. So the crucialness of our scholarship is that we are witnesses to an upheaval of power because this reaction against our communities is because we have risen. We have surfaced so much power and, and, and vision. And I think that at a time of where it can feel like there's increasing darkness, we have to remember we are artifacts of hope, each and every one of us. And that in so many ways, that the idea of decolonizing feminism is also to ask ourselves, even though uh, the master would want us to stick to the reactionary, how can we build the visionary in our work? And that for every hour that we spend documenting the problem, can we also dream of the future? And how do we ask for investments for dreaming in the future? Imagine how much money um, and how much work we could do if we had the same people who knew the problem also be invested in to come up with the solution, right? We know what we need. We know the kinds of schools we need. We know the kind of um, reproductive justice visions we need. We even know the kind of internet that we want. One where there's not extremists trying to rape and murder and kill you every which way, right? And yet, we're here on the side documenting the problem when we need to be building the solutions. And in some ways, it's about also shifting our strategies of, of power. That in a neoliberal context, and this was something we talked about earlier, neoliberalism would try to funnel us to only being human rights defenders. But I just say we just take over the whole shit, you know? <laughs> just take it all over, you know? We need to be the change makers and the stakeholders in every aspect of society, and we need to build those institutions now so that we can build the small houses that become the societal parallel. Because feminism is not a parallel. I mean, feminism is not an alternative. It is the answer to this moment. And I think that that's part of this journey of being able to talk about transnational solidarities is that as a Dalit person, you know, most people would never think, okay, wow, you know, a Dalit woman's here. I'm going to go see her at a talk in Harvard and, you know, maybe I'll walk away with an understanding of caste. But in reality, our discussion is really an understanding about what you need to get free. And that's really where international feminism really comes to um, a conversation that is vital for us today, is that go to where the margins are. Go to where the most quietest parts of the feminist discourse are, because that's where you'll actually see the experiments of capital. And if you see the people who resist there, you'll find the tools for liberation for all of us.
So thank you. from Jelena. I, I want to be sure we have some time at the end for conversation. So as we move through our next speakers, um, uh, with that in mind, but we're um, going to hear from Jelena Jovanovic next. Thank you very much. Uh, I think just before I start mentioning some of the state-sponsored uh, injustices, it is important to understand a little bit of context where I'm coming from because I'm gonna talk about institutions, or reactions or the lack of reactions, the silences of the institution because I'm coming from, from the organization where we are a network of Roma organizations and we mostly do, uh, mostly not only, but advocacy at the, both at the national at the, and the European level. So that's, that's just a little context. Um, the first point I would like to, to make here is that what is usually understood as Romani women's issues does not name the oppressor. And it assumes Roma as the problem. I think this is, this is one of the, the, the big problems that we are facing with when we talk about the Romani women's issues. And uh, from the perspective of institutions, uh, this would be low level of education, and, that, um, and then Romani women are unemployed because they're not educated, because they're housewives, they are taking care of many children, they live in poor housing con conditions, poor health care, early marriages, of course, uh, begging also, and uh, intersectional discrimination that most of the people, unfortunately, still um, uh, do not understand and uh, especially when it comes to applying it uh, in, the pra in practice. Um, but if we are uh, courageous and if we understand the main cause of uh, exclusion of Roma people, then uh, basically we have to talk about uh, uh, the most acceptable form of racism, what we call in my organization uh, anti-gypsism. Uh, the most acceptable form of racism in Europe. And then we talk about the ways our societies are organized. And then we also talk about societal racism and all the complexity of power structures. And then, only then, we can name the oppressor, oppressors and the obstacle. And when we start talking about, uh, uh, from this perspective, then we talk also about institutional racism. And then we start talking about segregation in maternity care departments that Alexandra was uh, already talking about, thank you very much. Uh, overcrowding, separation from newborn babies, racial harassment and humiliation in the hospitals, neglect, physical restraint and abuse during childbirth, uh, failures related to informed consent, and decision-making with regard to medical treatment. Then we talk about coercive, forced, and invol involuntary sterilization. Because I've been focusing mostly on reproductive and sexual rights, I mean, this is not, <laughs> these are not, a, this is not an exclusive uh, list. This is not a, the, the list of institutional injust injustices that Roman women face. Uh, we can talk about many other issues, and I would like to mention uh, some, something that, that maybe we, we haven't really uh, talked about, and this is uh, uh, environmental injustice. And I think this is very important. We don't really even, we, we haven't had a chance really to, to explore what is happening. But uh, uh, for example, in, there, is a, there is a community in France and they, uh, they are subjected to environmental injustice. They were asking authorities, women organized there, and women ask the authorities to respond. They want them to, to, to move their community to other place. The authorities, they don't do anything about it. Um, people get sick. Uh, they, uh, the children have a lot of health issues. 
uh, and then we can talk about uh, a lot of like different uh, different kind of phenomenon that then actually emerge as an impact of this situation. And uh, one of these uh, is that, uh, I mean, if we just think about a question, who is going, who is bringing children to the hospital? Mm -hmm. It's women, it's Romani women. And then Romani women are facing um, institutional racism in, that, in this context more frequently with Romani men. And, uh, and this, this is uh, something very, very, I think, very important that we, we, we have to start talking about among the Romani feminists and, and with, uh, uh, with our uh, allies. And uh, so I had this two list, you know, acceptable list of Romani issues <laughs> and, uh, and the list of uh, uh, Romani issues that the institutions are not talking about. And it, is, it was interesting because uh, during the for me, uh, because during the first panel, uh, you were saying that coercive sterilization was acceptable by the uh, human rights organization and also by the Roma, Romani movement. But, but if you think about institutions, that is the least acceptable <laughs> problem to talk about. In the Czech Republic, sterilized Romani women uh, uh, have still not been um, uh, compensated. Yes, some of them, they, uh, they did, but some of them, no. And this is an urgent issue that we are trying to, to push for. But I mean, this is, this is the question of, uh, of, of really like asking the government to do it now. These women will, will, will die and then nothing will happen. I mean, this is the same situation with the victims of, Romani victims of uh, Holocaust. Um, the, Third point I would like to, to make, and it is also a little bit maybe, maybe uh, different from uh, some of the, the, the statements I heard in, during the first panel, and it is um, the, the Roma women's leadership. Because I think, Deborah, you said that Roma women, they claim spaces, and, and, and yeah, we are here, but we are very few. We are very few, and I'm, I mean, I'm coming from Brussels. Like you can count on, on, uh, on well, maybe 10, maximum 10 Roma women who are like working in, in the institutions and the Roma NGOs in Brussels. And mostly in the Roma NGOs, of course. Because I guess that the salaries in the European Commission and the Parliament are too high for us. Um, <laughs> So uh, this, this issue of Roma, Romani women's leadership has really to be taken seriously and uh, we have to claim spaces. I mean, but I think uh, one of the big challenges uh, is that uh, we don't have uh, capacity, we don't have time to meet. And this is where, uh, we met a few days ago, with, I met with two Romani women, we already had great ideas. And we really think we have a really good idea and a strategy uh, that we created. But this is not happening because we are busy. And this is also a challenge when it comes to alliances. We are too busy with the problems and with uh, our organizational uh, tasks that we don't have time to discuss, we don't have time to meet. Mm. And I think this is, this is really, really a big issue. And just, we met for two hours and we already have, have great ideas, but we have to uh, start, valuing our, um, <laughs> start valuing ourselves a little bit more and somehow try to find time, uh, more time to do this. Uh, we will talk a bit later about um, Solidarity, or should I make a few more points because we were all talking uh, too long? Should um, we finish? Sure. Yes, I, I, I think we will talk about solidarity in our um, at the end as as, mm -hmm. as we okay. begin to close. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I think the theme of solidarity is interwoven, I think, throughout, but specificity around what that looks like, I think, is important. 
as well. Um, so next we will hear from uh, Sue. Oh. <laughs> Shape shifting. Uh, <laughs> Suhad Khatib. Uh, of course, be, you are free to do whatever is most Hi. comfortable. For is it okay you. if I speak from here? Because um, my back is killing me. Um, uh, Tanmuri said something today when we were having lunch um, that really stayed with me uh, about the ancestors uh, being present. There were so many stories that we shared today that were so beautiful. Um, I, I was telling her that, um, so I'm, a, I'm an artist and a filmmaker. I'm the artist who has the painting on the flyer. Um, and I'm um, also a filmmaker, and my very first film was uh, video art that was about gypsies in Jordan. So it was very interesting. I also, um, the day felt so familiar for me today. Um, it's April 8th, and I saw it, it was familiar to me because, oh, I'm speaking at Harvard on the 8th. But then I um, Googled my, um, my favorite writer who inspired me to, you know, study my Palestinian identity more, Kanafani. And today was his birthday, actually. So it is like a beautiful ancestral moment for me. And um, thank you so much for the Romani women for bringing us together here and for teaching us and sharing stories with us. And I hope that we are able to build in the future. Um, so, um, uh, so I'm an artist. Um, and uh, sometimes language becomes a, an issue for artists. And so one of the things that um, really helped me simplify and feel that I'm not alone in my confusion about language was uh, my, org my organizing during Ferguson. Um, uh, so I wanted to put together today a few things, a few words that I have learned over the course since 2014 until today, share with you um, some words just because a lot of people ask about Palestine but, you know, get confusing sources and for good reason. Uh, so I wanted to share with you uh, some of the words that I understood through my spiritual journey and organizing journey and artistic journey. The first one um, would be the spirit. Um, the spirit in the Quran is inspired by the, the space that we are in. Uh, the spirit in the Quran is the enlightened knowledge that you accumulate in this life. Um, that knowledge is up to you. Who do you give it to, and how long? Uh, who do you share it with, and how how big is that knowledge? How big is that spirit? Uh, the spirit is the one thing that lives after we are gone, after our physical is gone, and it lives beyond us, like Kenafani does, like Malcolm X is with us in the room. This is the spirit. Um, um, Islam. I'm also here not just a Pal as a Palestinian woman, brown woman in America, I'm also here as a Muslim. And um, Islam, according to the Quran, is an Abrahamic ideology. It's not a religion like people like to say. I know there are a lot of confusion about a lot of things, but since we're decolonizing, might as well decolonize a lot of things. Um, this Abrahamic ideology believes in a single um, power that is the creator, and that the creator, the, the theory is that the creator does not change, but the creation has got to change. So that brings me to the next word that I learned is that change is inevitable. And any, anything and anyone who does not um, get on with change will be lost over the evolution um, cycle. And so if you measure all of these things on the movements that we're working and the connections that we're building, Things have got to change. The way the institution talks about specific things have got to change. Our words and understanding of each other has got to change as well. Um, Palestine. Um, um, Palestine is uh, my home, whether the colonizers want it or not. Um, I am second generation. My father survived the massacre when he was four years old. Um, but I can't say that we all survived that massacre because we are war survivors and there's a lot there. Um, you will hear a lot about Palestine. It's, a lot of people are talking about it these days, but they're talking about it and some of them are talking about it in the same way they talk about uh, windmill cancer, if you heard about that. Um, Palestine was colonized by the Ottomans for hundreds of years. After that, the British colonized it. And then after that, and right now, the Zionists are colonizing it. Um, 
Palestine is home for everyone. This is where Abraham passed. This is where Jesus was born. And it's a land for everyone. It's not a land for one people over the other. Zionism. Um, Zionism is a colonial ideology that benefits from economies of war, very similar to the country that we live in. Um, that's why you will find that the governments here, you will find a lot of the senators and the presidents that will come to power trampling over themselves to associate themselves with Zionism because um, they see a lot of commonality there. And we were talking today about the commonality between some of the companies that are benefiting from colonialism in Palestine, that are also benefiting from um, the uh, surveillance on the border and the illegal kidnap of the children, that is also benefiting from the prison industrial complex and oppression of black people. There's also, it, I was learning today from Timur, do you want to tell them how is it be benefiting Bromism? It's also benefiting Bromism, and they work together and they have technological advances and they, yeah, maybe later, yeah, but put a pin in that. Um, art. So, art, uh, I, I stopped painting for nine years uh, because, um, um, because I'm an Arab woman and I've um, suffered a lot of oppression as an Arab woman and that was my reaction is to just drop the thing that I love the most. Uh, for a while, um, I went back to it to find, like I said, the words that I couldn't find in language, the expressions to express myself through it. Um, Philosophically speaking, um, art is what differentiates us from animals. This is, we did not just do evolution, ev our evolution as humans was not just physical, it was also emotional and moral. And one of the things that proved that we became human was our ability to create. And so um, colonizers usually try to take away our time, take away our spirits, um, take away our, our, our soul so that we do not create art. And we need art in the movements. And I, I really want everyone in the, in the room today and everyone who's watching this to really invest time in, in self-expression and telling their story. Because what we have right now from all of the stories that we've heard today is that they're trying to, to drown our personal stories. And art is the best way to imagine what liberation looks like. <clears throat> liberation. Um, liberation. You know, over the, four, the past four years, I'm turning 40 this year, so I'm feeling exceptionally enlightened. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thank you. <laughs> um, liberation, I learned in um, these 40 years, uh, which is something I've been searching for my entire life. I've learned that liberation has to be individual first so that it can be collective for all of us. So I wanted to wrap with a prayer, since we are in this beautiful space, um, I would like to pray for all of us that we find our spiritual that will guide us through our individual liberation so that, all we, so that we can all be free, because I am so ready. Thank you. I guess we're ready to go to uh, questions. Um, or do you want your comments now? Sure. I'll okay. Do, yeah. Beautiful. Um, All right. I'm, I'm formally the discussant, so ah. I start off our okay. questions right. and then we Wonderful. will kick it to the floor. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> ready? Yes. Okay. So it's your turn. Thank you all for coming. This has been such an amazing conversation. I feel like when I say that, I speak for myself, but also everyone in the room. I've been really making a point to observe everyone's faces as these panelists have been speaking. And I think this conversation has been so amazing to just sit on the end of, so thank you. Um, something uh, that I noticed in hearing each of you speak and a thread through all of you, um, I think actually bookends what Professor Collins started us off with and that the thread I heard through everyone was the importance of the archive mm -hmm. and how building an archive that is ours and that 
speaks to all our different feminisms, but also all our different oppressions, all our different histories, does seem essential in what Professor Collins raised as flipping the script, because we build our own. Initial responses? No? Okay. <laughs> so, agree. <laughs> so something I observed in terms of, I'm, I'm a journalist and I come from a reporting background and I cannot tell you how heartbreaking it is when you do go to tell a story from a really foundational level and you go to the archive and that history is not there. It literally stops history from being written when you go and these accounts, these really important reports, this data, these diary entries, these memoirs, these letters are not there. So the archive is how we will become liberated. <laughs> um, a question I have uh, that I also heard pieces of come through in all your different accounts. I, much like was said earlier um, at the farther end of the table, echoing Lord's comments about the master's tools will never tear, tear down the master's house. I'm curious as to how we can go inward to build and find our own solutions, but with a question of resources. Um, considering who holds resources, who those gatekeepers are, their power, how do we build our own solutions without assimilating or even a step further conceding on certain really important points? Yeah, please. Do you want to start? Sure. At me. <laughs> um, wow, that's a deep question. So um, in my real, real life, I am a creative director. Um, and uh, my job is basically branding. Um, so I brand for big tech companies. And um, I, um, I understand the power of brand and the power of the power in creating that brand and uh, making it so loud that you can't hear anything else. Um, also, as a Palestinian and as a woman, I understand that um, I am systematically being disenfranchised to not occupy certain spaces and not tell certain stories. Um, as an organizer, when we were in, in Ferguson, I noticed the institution has a specific rhetoric I don't know if it was in, you know, uh, institutional or if it was you know, random where they want to simplify the language, but it wasn't really simplifying for me. So um, for me personally, what I did is just divorce myself from all of it and took some time off um, to heal, first of all. And then after that, I went into art and that was like kind of my form of um, archiving the stories that I, I know exist and I know it very well because it's my story and no one else can dispute it. And um, I archived it through art. Yeah, I would like to reflect a little bit of, on the archives and maybe a little bit more on the resources issue. Um, I mean, for us, uh, people who do, do uh, work on a policy level, uh, stories, are very important, and <laughs> and I mean this is basically the aim. My aim, the aim of my colleagues, is to build the poli policies that will be informed um, with realities of Roma people. Because um, by now they, they they just simply haven't been. The policies are they have been informed by non-informed, if I could say something like this. So this is why the Roma voice is extremely important in this sense. And uh, when it comes to resources, I'm thinking about two, uh, well, one alternative and one just simply um, strive to, to, to achieve the the power position where you can be the one who will decide. <laughs> and the other one is, like for example in Hungary, I was talking to some Roma activists, uh, they, were, they were saying that there is a lot of money from the European Union projects for Roma. And a lot of money is spent by non-Roma. And a lot of uh, European Union, for, uh, in order to to, to get the, the project of the uh, finance by the EU is uh, 
you have to be a very good administrator. You have to have a, a really like a, a strong capacity. And there are a lot of Roma NGOs who do not benefit mm -hmm. from the projects for Roma. <laughs> and uh, often the good administrators who are implementing EU projects are not interested in the local contexts. So, and what Roma NGOs do, they do small initiatives according to their resources that they have. And they help, some ch they help children after school classes and so on and so forth. They do a lot of things. And at the end of the day, people are saying that these small initiatives are much more effective <laughs> than these big projects uh, implemented by, by, uh, by non-Roma. So I think that's, I mean, at the same time, it is a good and a bad news. <laughs> so this is uh, about, about resources, what, what we can do in, uh, in our situation. Thank you. So I think that, you know, to kind of answer your question, I think that, you know, the battle of the archive is like the battle of the imaginary. Uh, because in some ways, you know, and we talked about this earlier, that most people can't begin to fight for freedom because they can't imagine themselves to be free. And that the imagination becomes crippled because people don't have their roots in freedom, in their history. So when we see radical history that is told from those who are from those backgrounds, we have new options and new possibilities because we actually see that resilience was there all the way along. So in terms of my work, I, I'm the founder, uh, I'm the co-founder of a project called Delith History Month, and April is Delith History Month, so happy Delith History Month. Um, primarily because um, we started this project because as women who were working around um, caste rape and caste um, intersections of caste and gender-based violence, at a certain point you would run into upper caste people who would say, but how do we leave our culture? How do, we, how do we leave this behind? Because we don't have any other tradition, any other lineage in the subcontinent. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, there is actually an incredible history of caste resilience that comes from caste oppressed peoples that talks about gender equity, that talks about the eradication of caste and Brahminism, and that also centered rationalism in the face of incredible superstitious violence. And that is rooted in Dalit history. So when we tell our stories and we tell them iteratively where we see them in the context of the present as we look for possibilities in the future, I think that's actually what allows us to be free, which is why the archive is such a powerful tool of um, activating the imaginary. But I also think this thing about resources is really critical because it's the difference between you having a begging bowl and asking your oppressor to you being able to be self-determined. And I think that a lot of times, like what, um, what we do in our institution, and I run an organization called the Quality Labs, is we just go in and we just be the unruly women at the table. So, you know, when it comes to, you know, funding South Asian projects, 100% of all of the grant officers are upper caste, most of whom are Brahmin. So when you talk to them about creating liberatory caste frameworks, they, they're like, well, yes, that's really great, but we have an upper caste organization that's doing that. And I said, you would have a hissy fit if that was a white woman running a project in India. Then why do you think you would give money to, work, to projects working around caste to upper caste women that, that actually gatekeep and don't allow caste oppressed women to the table? So because we, um, we're transnational, we, we're, not, we're comfortable challenging the funders, which need to be challenged around these issues. Um, but I also think that we need to build the alternatives. And that ultimately is going to be the other place where we're going to find resource generation. Because in a neoliberal model, communities like ours will only be seen on the receiving end of development funds. But they give us development funds while they steal the future. So we need to be actual caretakers and stakeholders of the future. So we need to be technologists. We need to be thinking about the frontiers of science and thinking about ways we can create just infrastructure with that that centers our values but positions us with the future. And I think that that's a much harder proposition because development doesn't allow us to think in those ways. 
but I think being able to find partnerships with other communities, being able to do small experiments, because again, I think small experiments often open up those other possibilities, and pushing the funders to invest and letting us fail. Because the thing with white men is that white men fail all the time. And they're actually given lots of monies to fail all the time. You know, there's like a, there was an app, right? There was an app in Silicon Valley that was given a million dollars for just the fact that you could text yo to someone else. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not shitting at you guys. This is actually what I'm saying about the cachet of being a white man is you can fail and be paid to fail, you know, or be given the presidency, right? Just slipping that by. Um, but, but anyway, but, but I'm saying that what if, what if women of color were invested in to fail? What if we could dream and try lots of different options to say, hey, we know the problem for education. We need to build a community school. Give us a million dollars and see what we can do with it. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but all the lessons will go iteratively into the next phase. Right? So I think that's what sometimes we need to demand more. We need to value our ingenuity and our resilience far more than we allow ourselves. And again, break down the master's house and build our own, you know? Yeah, this is so beautiful. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I can add to that. Uh, maybe just really, okay, just very shortly. I think the archive, the needs of archive, it's a kind of recurring theme because it came up in our, in the other meeting as well. So I, I really think as well that archive is an essential, it's a foundational to build, to, to actually imagine our future and, um, and imagine our strategies in a very creative way. And of course, if we want to flip the narrative, if we want to change the narrative, we need the archive as well as a, as a foundational work. So concerning resources and um, tools and, um, um, and mechanisms or processes, certainly tools and mechanisms may be more available than financial resources, but I think we have to be creative and we have to penetrate in those places which were not really uh, used yet or was not imagined and we have to be creative and we have to use you know the contradictions in the global capitalism and use it, use it as an avenue to expand our places stop here <laughs> it's remained really abstract but i think you can get I think I'd start off by saying that um, most oppressed people lack resources. That's really what oppression is. So um, how do we <laughs> make a way out of no way? So that's the question. How, how have people leveraged or used the resources that we have and toward what ends? Uh, so for me, going back to the original when I was talking about survival and freedom, you know, when, when you're thinking about basic survival, there are just certain things you have to get resources for. All right, you've got to feed people, you have to have some, you know, you have to do the best that you can with those basic survival issues. But that doesn't mean that life is reduced to that. All right, and so the whole notion of, of course you can see the constraints of what you can't do and what you don't have. But the whole question of how do you imagine the possibilities with what you do have and how you use what you have creatively, even if it appears to be very little. And I happen to think that uh, once we get out of, you know, we're in a very resource rich setting. So in some ways it's intimidating to think, well, I have nothing, you know, I can't do anything unless I have this. Mm -hmm. I think it's the reverse. I've worked with so many people. I mean, the people who really are in community organizing, I tell you, there are so many ways of just being creative with what you have. If you're clear about what you're trying to do. To me, it's more a question of, of not being clear about what the, what the project is. Because if you know what you're trying to do, you can imagine all kinds of ways, smart, because you know, people who are oppressed are actually smart. Mm -hmm. Smart enough to get over, to get stuff, to figure it out, to liberate it, to take it home. My mother worked for the government. She would just bring a stapler home. 
you know, and just put it in her suit and put it in her purse, you know, so that when I had a stapler, you know, I had a ruler and I had a this and I had a that. I mean, now my mother was stealing from the government. If you wanted to hear, you know, the dominant discourse of what this was, and she was not a thief at all, but she just realized that, you know, we need this, we need that, we need this, we need that, and women are very good at this. This is the other thing, you know, part of feminism in terms of survival and imagination in the context of constraint. Uh, earlier, the, the whole notion of Hmm. the biggest gift that you can give someone, the best resource you can give someone is the love to sustain. So they can imagine something different for themselves. So I think if we just think about resources as material resources, or if we think about it as in the here and now, like doing our taxes, that kind of approach to resources this time of the year, we, we miss the fabric of what investment really is. Right? I see resources as investing in something that matters. And even if you don't see the payoff of what you've invested in, particularly if it's people, it, it's worth doing. So, um, you know, don't squander it. <laughs> Thank you, Koa, for uh, leading that. And we have, um, we're winding up on our time. So we have time just for a few questions and we will take them um, together uh, so that we can sort of do a rapid uh, answering and then we will come back um, with Professor Jackie Baba for our conclusion. Yes. Questions? Yes. What? Go. Okay, now we can, now we can hear you. <laughs> so in this movement towards like liberation, um, what does your joy look like? Because I feel like that part is always left out when we are, we're in these types of conversations. And as like community organizers, young, I'm burnt out. So like I do want to know what has sustained you and what has brought you joy. Yes, uh, another question? <laughs> yes, we're taking, we're taking. You can. Yes. I'm just wondering how you deal with the concept of, of decolonization, especially, uh, ah, especially about the language. This is what previously we talked with, with the Professor Patricia Collins. Like, in context of the Roma, uh, Roma community, that we are using the decolonizing language as a Roma inclusion that bothers me a lot. Because I feel, as a Roma woman, that somebody wants to include me somewhere, to fit me in, to put me like an outsider within somewhere, to compromise my identity. How we can deal with that, with that language that creates the camouflage in front of us that is decolonization, but is not, in fact. Mm. And how we can recognize that, because mm. sometimes it's not even recognizable. Good, thank you. All right. Yes. Um, so my question is very personal. As an international student right now from Iran in US, um, th last three years in my um, classes and learning about black feminist thought and uh, being working with Professor Mohanty and transnational feminism and all of those resources, what I've been dealing with all the time has been about um, this, how not to, not, how not to be involved with uh, Olympics of oppression among the, with other women of color and not only talk about me, 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 my story, but at the same time, at the same time being erased in all the discussions, mm -hmm. in all the conversations in classes, and really not being able to understand how to have that, have that thing about claiming a space and talking about your story, but at the same time being able to listen. So this balance between listening and talking and really having, because that, that is also something as an, as an Iranian woman, I feel lots of, I really deal with the individualism that exists in this country. So 
how not to you know, be trapped in the individualized stories and uh, me, me, me conversations, but at the same time having a space and being able to have in solidarity and being interested in other people's pain and stories. So I hope if there, any comment would be appreciated. Thank you. All right, so I, we will take one more um, in this cycle before uh, we wrap up. Come, would you like to? Sure, yeah. absolutely. Thank you. All right, who do you want to? Do you want me to start? Yes, please. Um, OK, uh, I'm going to start with the question about joy, because I love that question so much. Thank you for asking that. Because it's really important, you know, like I feel um, that, that that's something I really love to talk about with youth a lot, um, because uh, you get burnt out. It's a lot to, the, you know, like this morning we were sharing stories and I was like, okay, I need to take a break, go home and meditate for a little bit because, um, I, I don't, you know, the older you get, the more fragile, I think. I, at least I, I am becoming like, just like um, tired of it because especially when it's stories about children, like, like Tanmuri was saying, it's like there's an urgency right now. It's, it's, um, it feels like there's an acceleration of violence against against everyone and it's like that's what happens in economies of war right like they're they're greedy they want more and they're just I don't know you know I thought in the past that maybe now we because of social media we know more about each other's struggles but I'm learning that there's also an acceleration of how that struggle is happening and it's more invisible in ways but it's more obvious in others um, uh, so joy becomes really important, um, especially that I have a child that I want to be in good energy around her. Um, so I try to be in positive energy for her, but I know that she's also my positive energy. So it's, it's mutual, you know, it's a cycle. Um, but also I found so much solace in um, uh, unlearning a lot of uh, um, cultural things that I was also, you know, we were talking earlier about like, do we talk about the cultural uh, difficulties that we have as oppressed women within our communities or do we focus on colonialism as a reason for it? And I think maybe we talk about both at the same time, but in different spaces, there's a space for each one of them, right? So how do you unlearn some of the, um, the, the oppression that is placed upon you within your community as well? On top of it, there's like the colonial on top of it. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, uh, uh, anger that comes with that, and you have to learn how to forgive, and then what does forgiveness mean? Um, and then you have to revert to spirituality, and that's why I wanted to use the word, I wanted to share some of these con concepts, because those are concepts that really helped me in like um, unlearning so and, and detangling some of those mixed emotions. And the spirit, when you understand that this is the knowledge that you're accumulating, you're you're, this is the enlightened knowledge that you're not just reading holy books, you're also learning it from a historical context of like humanity. You're understanding that we are all one, we are really all one. So, you know, if I'm gonna go, every, like everything is gonna go, if the bees go, we're all gonna be gone, you know? So it's just, you start learning things from a different perspective of things. And, um, and that goes also to the question about oppression Olympics. Um, uh, you know, like that, that's one of, like it, it's all inter, it's interlaced because uh, once you understand that other people's pain is also your pain, and like we were talking about this earlier, the word solidarity really becomes blurry for me. You know, I, um, it was a very difficult um, space to be a Palestinian during Ferguson, like while it's happening. 
uh, because I'm seeing all of the connections, but I really can't talk about it right now because it's happening right now. I need to be quiet and learn because also I'm an international. I don't know about black struggle in the US. I, you know, I'm, I'm learning things through the media and the propaganda that is coming my way. So I just need to learn it from a personal perspective of like one to one. And um, that knowledge brings me joy, like even if it's painful, uh, no, no, knowing that I'm in the right place, I'm, I'm, I'm taking the right steps towards understanding bigger, bigger kind of pain that includes me but includes other women, other women and we, together we can figure something out. Um, spirituality and um, knowledge about Audre Lorde, reading Frantz Fanon, reading Kenafani, all of these books tell me that it goes beyond me. It's ancestral. It, this, is, this is something that's also bigger than me. And um, continuing to do art, that's why also I was talking about creativity because going back to art has not only healed me because I went on a journey of doing self-portraits so, so that I can help my understand what I'm going through, through divorce, through uh, upri an uprising. I just went through an uprising and a divorce and I moved to another city and I... I don't have all of the tools to deal with all of it. So to compartmentalize, I started doing art just to see like what are the patterns that are being re repetitive. And when I understood the power that was in that art of me, for me, I started bringing other women with me. I started painting other Arab women from you know, archival material and like just reclaiming them and giving them power, giving them a big heart or giving them you know, a gun, you know, like a, just like to, to empower them through um, that, vessel of time. So um, that's about language and that's about joy and, oh, that's about um, oppression of Olympics and joy. Um, language, thank you a lot for that question too because um, language is so fundamental, especially and like very critical, not in like on, on issues of Palestine, on all of the issues and we were talking about it today. Like I didn't get to fem feminism because I don't, you know, I'm, I don't want to share my thoughts about the word itself, um, but I be, I'm a believer that um, language is ever-changing, and we as oppressed people are constantly finding different ways to express ourselves and find out what, what does it mean. Like we were talking about today, like I didn't know some of the words to use uh, to express my oppression as a Palestinian, until I was in Ferguson. I didn't know what a prison industrial complex was until black youth told me in Ferguson. And then I was like, oh, we have that in Palestine. Is that what it's called? I, you know, to me, it's all colonialism, but there's like structure on top of oppression on top of oppression. We have to t detangle that. So we're constantly learning new language, but we're also reframing some of the words that we already have from before, I hope. Thank you, Sarah. You don't have to take all the questions, just okay. whichever one. Okay, yeah. super. Just in the interest of time. Uh, what makes me happy? <laughs> it's a very interesting question, a lot of things, but I will be a little bit general <laughs> to answer it shortly. Uh, it makes me happy when I see the opportunity for any kind of intervention that could potentially bring a change, even the small one. I'm not saying that we should be happy with small changes, but I think we have to think both about the short term and the long term. So that's kind of like the opportunity. Um, when it comes to language, uh, I completely understand uh, Tanya's question, and <laughs> we experience this uh, oppressive language from the coming from the institutions and um, uh, for, for those who do not know there is a, a targeted policy uh, in Europe for Roma and they, they don't even call it Roma for Roma inclusion they, they call it even worse it's a national Roma they are, they are making a national Roma integration strategies uh, and what we do to change it is like basically uh, lobbying and now it is a kind of accept, ac accepted uh, by the institution and everybody, like a lot of powerful actors are now working to change completely, the, <laughs> to change the framework, framing and to put more emphasis or at least to complement 
the inclusion approach with the anti-racist approach and the human rights approach. So that's the thing. And uh, me, 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 I will just say, because I already talk about challenges, but I don't want to be like uh, understood as only those uh, uh, talking about, like only talking about problems, but <laughs> without ideas for solutions. So I think like at, uh, you said, I think like we can do at least small things, even though we are quite limited when it comes to uh, spaces and, and uh, uh, possibilities for solidarity. I think, like, just just a small thing that we can do, the, the mentioned organization, the, the famous European Women's Lobby, uh, they approached me and they asked me, uh, my organization, they asked me, for example, to comment on some report, and, and I mean, they are valid organization. People use their, <laughs> use their, their, their text. And, uh, and okay, I, had some input and I asked them to also include other marginalized groups, not only Roma women. So like these kind of things we can do that even these kind of little things that are important sometimes we, we forget mm -hmm. because we are too self, uh, self focused. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, I will skip it one question. Thank you. Um, so I'll talk quickly. Um, so I think that, you know, for me, the thing that brings me joy is I think with a lot of our work, it sometimes is very lonely because you're thinking about all this stuff to try to like free yourself and you're just like, brr, 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 brr. and then all of a sudden you look up and then you realize you've touched so many lives because when you theorize your own freedom, you actually find that you're freeing so many people, some whom you never get a chance to meet. And, and I think that to me brings me real joy, especially working with other people that are caste depressed. Um, you know, as one of the first Dalit women online, the, the weirdest thing about talking about my experience was that so many other Dalit people came out to me and I got to know my people by telling my story. And I, I found that really a remarkable experience because we are such a vast and powerful people that we still don't even know how strong and wonderful we are. And that, that is what really brings me a lot of joy. And cooking with my mom, like she's really, really great. Um, but I think this other thing about solidarity and feeling like you're not seen sometimes, but also looking at how do we create relationships that aren't transactional. And my sense is, is that I think that corporate white feminism creates transactional solidarity. But like real solidarity is co-liberatory and I think it takes a lot of time and it starts with like eating with each other and getting to know each other and that you don't go to tactics and strategy, you go with like understanding your histories and, and it, you have to be able to also be in each other's geographic and cultural context. So my, my sense is that traveling with people, going to their homes, um, that makes all the difference. Because like for again, like with, you know, for our Romani kindred that are here, it was one thing to read about the, the Romani culture, another thing to sit with Roma people in Hungary. Because I saw myself in them. I went to the slums that they lived in that looked like the slums in India. We talked exactly about the, you know, it's, it's a thing about hearing the timber of the voice. It's about sitting and seeing like the, the way that like oppression kind of changes your skin but also like how there's like hope in the eyes when you talk about possibility. That, that exchange of the spirit is really what to me feels like is the potential of real solidarity that only comes from relationship building. And, and I think those investments are really hard to get. Like it's, you know, could you imagine like this really powerful black, Palestinian, Dalit, Roma exchange program for feminists around the world? But, ex but I actually think that's what we need. You know, this small panel is a potential of what that could look like. But in order for us to dream bigger than white supremacy and Brahminism and Zionism, we need time to, to build and dream together. You know? And I think in some ways, this could be the seed of that conversation. But, um, but I think we also have to be able to, to, to ask for it because we sometimes think that we're not going to get it if we don't ask for it. So I think if you feel that you're invisibilized or you feel like people aren't hearing you, I just say, just say it, talk about it, you know? And usually if you point to the problem, someone else is having that problem and that usually opens up to the solution. And, and I'm not talking like woke, you know, woke culture where it's like, I'm gonna call you out and blah, 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 and like get into a social media war because sometimes people feel like an intellectual knowing is the same thing as knowing. And that's not, that's not what movement building is about. 
you know. And so movement orientation, I think, also helps with that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Do either of you? Uh, I think I'd like to uh, re respond to just some thoughts about each of the questions, all right, but not necessarily the direct, the order in which they were asked. And I would start with the last question. I'm not going to be depressing here, but it may sound like it for a minute. <laughs> all right, uh, the challenges that face transnational solidarity. Um, I think this is a really important question because anything that is a genuine threat to existing power relations, you have to expect that it will be re resisted. And that is what the challenge is. It was interesting that the example was the Panthers. That was an organization that, what, two things, well, one thing happened. Repression is really one thing that we face. If something really becomes powerful enough, the ideas may be repressed or the movement or the institution or whatever it is. I would not in any way underestimate the power of the opponent to do this in terms of repression. And the second thing, uh, if, you, if you can, seduction. I think that's a tremendous challenge. When someone seduces you to go along with the agenda or the program and buys you off or pays you off or tells you how wonderful you are and you're not like all the others, that kind of thing. So over time, when I look at the challenges that I've seen, sort of the combination of the carrot and the stick, and how that can actually shut down progressive solidarity. It can really affect vision, imagination, all those things. One has to also be perpetually vigilant for this type of uh, response. So I'm going to start with that and then just say, well, having said that, how are we vigilant? One way that we're vigilant is a critical analysis of the dominant discourse that we've been given. And that is a lot of what's been going on in this conversation today about uh, challenging de uh, decolonization or decolonizing anything and recognizing that that particular term can be stripped of its power, right? It can either be repressed or it can be, you can be seduced into using a term that no longer has the meaning that it originally had. So we think we're having this amazingly progressive discourse, but we're not <laughs> at all. We're using an empty word in ways that have seduced us to actually not see other things. Uh, so the original um, question was, I think was what we talked about this uh, privately, but it was more, you're not liking the language of inclusion, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, and in some ways, uh, decolonizing something assumes that it can be fixed. All right, that uh, decolonizing something assumes that you can reform it as opposed to, well, maybe it can't be fixed or reformed. So do you want to be included in something that fundamentally says in order for this thing to continue, you have to assimilate? Those are the terms of inclusion. Because the structural nature of racism that you were talking about is very durable and it's difficult to change. I, I'm not going to be... I know this is gloomy, and we want to end the panel on an uplifting note and all that. But anyhow, all right, but, but I think it's really important to just be pragmatic about all of this, because these are long-term uh, issues that I'm bringing up. This is the nature of a long-term sustained struggle. This is what's involved. All right. And then the third, to the, student who, or the person who talked about being erased. I would say to you, you're, you're sitting in class and somebody's erasing you, and how do you fit into this particular situation, and oh, I don't see myself there. Forget it. Maybe you don't belong in there. You belong in there. But when it comes to telling one's own story so that when you come back, rather than saying, let me in, let me in, it's this whole inclusion assimilation model, you actually work elsewhere. You, make, you build these communities that you were talking, where'd you go? <laughs> you build these communities of folk who are like-minded who might also see the same problem that you see. And in doing that, you actually transform that discourse. And I think you point out something really important that the individualism of these discourses, to me, very often is incredibly narcissistic. And we've got to be you know, careful to tell the difference between self-care, really caring for self, and, and a narcissistic individualism that buys into the consumer culture that we're living in and the politics that we're living in that flourishes by teaching us not to see structures and flourishes by teaching us not to build communities or to imagine. Okay, now that was the, like the dash of cold water. You started us with, what brings you joy? <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna do a hokey answer and a not hokey answer, all right? <laughs> I'll do the personal answer. What brings you joy is all these things we've been talking about. Imagination, art. What brings me joy is dance. Mm -hmm. That's freedom, 
You know, I mean, by yourself, sometimes it looks a little weird, all right? But if with others, the whole notion of moving in solidarity and creating something, and that happens to be my venue. Uh, so what the hokey answer would also be, to be honest with you, 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 you can, your bad self over there. <laughs> Because I really feel a lot of what brings me joy is looking at people grow. I mean, yeah. it's really altruistic to what can you do to actually nurture something. If you like, you grow plants, for example, and your little plant grew, you know, it looked like it was going to die because you forgot to water it. But <laughs> that, kind of, that kind of incremental, and it may be a nurturing spirit, I don't know what it is, but it brings me joy mm -hmm. to be able to see the change, all right? And to think maybe I've made a contribution. I think that's how people feel about their children. They're excited about their children. Even if the children are just badly behaved, whatever. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, so the notion of what brings you joy, and when you combine those two, when you combine for me dance and children, I'm gonna, I'd like to finish with one little story because I think it speaks to the make a way out of no way, mm. all right? Uh, this was when I was working in the community schools here in Boston and I was teaching dance to children. And uh, one of the places we were in, we were evicted from the school that we were in. We were having classes in a nursing home. It was a horrible facility. Clearly it was not set up for little children. And I was to teach a dance class. This is the first day down in the basement. They said, just go on in there, it's fine. Can you imagine a room that's completely painted black? Black ceiling, black walls, black floor. I have no idea what was on their mind. And here I am with these little energetic children. And I looked in the corner and there were actually traps where they had food for the rats. All right, so and I just thought, okay, how, do we, we're, how are we gonna do this? I said, we're gonna now create thunder. Thunder with our feet. It was the drum, you remember the earlier drum thing? You know, like, and they came in dancing into that room, collectively making thunder, and we made noise, and then we created even in that alienating, horrible space. So for me, the issue is to never forget the humanity of other people and yourself. And when you do that, and you can do that in conjunction with knowing that was so much better than my giving them a lesson on how oppressed they were. All right, oh, you poor little children, I feel so bad for you, let's just leave. You know, I mean, it was more, you know, how do you actually use what you have, the resources question, by the way, again, uh, to bring yourself joy in the context of living with oppression. And I think people who are on the bottom, who, who survive it, and they're resilient, have all kinds of ways to do that. So I don't know what your way will be. I know what my little way was and the stories I take with me and the fact that you stood up with your swag to ask that question. You had swag in your question. That said to me, I think you know what yours is. All right. <laughs> All righty. So anyhow, um, that, those are my comments about the, the commentary. <laughs> Well, that was amazing, and um, I attest to the fact that we have a legacy of joy that has always coexisted within our movement. Um, so um, to close us out, thank you for bearing with us. We realize we're just a few minutes over time, but I'd like to um, introduce and bring up Professor Jacqueline uh, Baba, who is a professor of practice uh, of Health and Human Rights at the Harvard T.H. Uh, Chan School of Public Health. She's also the Director of Research at the Harvard FXB Center for Health and Human Rights. And thank you, Professor Baba. Well, thank you all. That really was an extraordinarily inspiring afternoon, and I feel kind of like I shouldn't say anything after <laughs> Professor Collins's <laughs> rousing comments about what gives her joy. I so agree with her. Um, but um, I'll just make a very brief uh, um, summary to, to pull together the threads of this very rich, uh, inspiring conversation. I should say, first of all, for some of us who, who sit at the kind of one end of the age spectrum, what's also so inspiring is to see this intergenerational conversation, which doesn't always take place in kind of 
burgeoning political movement. So I think that, nobody mentioned that, but I certainly, from my vantage point, listening to some of the comments took me back uh, many, many uh, decades, and, and uh, it, it's actually a wonderful feeling. So I'm just going to make three quick points. One, we started with the um, imperative of talking back on the first panel, the, import the importance of challenging a kind of dominating narrative, a kind of uh, even within your own group or your own people, as some people have been talking about, um, and uh, challenging an oppressive norm that's assumed to encompass you, which is a really good place to start, I think. And from there, we went on to talk about the importance of different movements, different senses of culture, but always stressing the importance of not being essentialist. And that, I think, is such an important message because we all inhabit those spaces in different ways. And we had such great examples this afternoon of you know, different ways in which people thought about the connections and the tensions between um, struggles against racism, struggles, struggles against patriarchy, or whatever you're going to call it. So I think that was a really good starting point. And um, as our wise discussant said very pithily, um, there was talk about creating an archive, creating a record, creating a trace so that this meeting, the meetings that you've had over the weekend and over the past few days, what we, what we enunciate, what we paint, what we, how we dance, what we write, these are creating um, a bedrock of shared knowledge to build on for the future. That's very important. So that's kind of point one. Point two, um, I was really struck, and this is a personal reflection, by the extraordinary commonalities between some of the struggles that some of you in the first panel were talking about and struggles that we 30, 40, 50 years ago, maybe not 50, but 30 or 40 years ago went through, kind of like, for example, questions of virginity, you know, proving virginity, testing virginity, ascertaining virginity, but also the whole political and strategic discussion about what you do with your dirty linen. Do you air it in public or do not? Just think of the struggles within the ANC and in the women within the ANC taught to shut up because, you know, the first thing that has to happen is the struggle against apartheid. It's true of every liberation movement. Um, that, that same sense of tension about, about, you know, the question that Magda asked, you know, how do you relate to the kind of oppression that you feel from the outside, but you also the oppression you feel from within, and what do you do with those kind of contrasting feelings? And I think there is no easy um, answer, but I think it's really important to air those, those tensions and to be aware of them and to build the solidarity to, to, um, to act. And so I think I will actually end by borrowing from what uh, Patricia Hill Collins said. I think I loved her three words, survival, freedom, and imagination. And I just don't think you could sum up the energy in this room and the struggles ahead better than just thinking for a second about those three powerful words. Firstly, survival, which is really where we started. You know, the killing of, of Roma people, the sterilization of Roma women, and we had references to the Dalit struggle, which is an absolutely fierce struggle at the moment uh, with an oppressive government, um, you know, completely dis disingenuously appropriating aspects of of Indian culture for itself in, it, in its, in its uh, oppressive mode. So, so survival, the importance of, you know, being able to love your own child. I think the artist mentioned, her, you know, being whole for your own daughter. But um, all those different aspects of survival, of having resources and so on, it was a very rich discuss discussion, I think. Secondly, freedom and our many uh, different versions of what freedom is, what freedom should be. And I think what's so great about this meeting was the conviction that freedom means inclusion of people who are struggling mm. from different places against common odds and against common maybe enemies or oppressors uh, or common power structures or common inequalities or injustices. So that freedom, building it together in a non-sectarian way, I think nothing could be more important than in many of the spaces that we now live and work today that is such a hard sentiment to, to get, keep hold of because uh, we are up against divisive forces that try to pit one community against the other, you know, 
poor whites against Latinos, and on and on. I don't need to instantiate it. So that notion of solidarity, I think, was critical. But lastly, you know, this, this discussion about, about joy and about imagination, um, that's the privilege that we have, those of us privileged enough, as indeed everybody in this room is, to inhabit spaces which give you the time to reflect and the time to step back um, and to build the imagination. So many people actually struggle to do that in, in daily lives, which are very harsh and very long days of just kind of making ends meet. So that privilege of, of the imagination is, is a great resource. And I think we have an obligation to make it serve others, but also to enjoy it for what it does to our own coming together and building a movement. So thank you all for this real energy. And thank you very much to the inspiring organizers for, uh, for in this holy place, putting together this very holy discussion. So well done. <laughs>